Hello everyone, my name is Luciana Benotti. I'm a researcher at Universidad Nacional de Córdoba and CONICET. And I'm collaborating with Via Libre here in this series of interviews related to artificial intelligence and ethics. I'm very happy to have Sasha Luchoni here with us. We will explore with her the question, who benefits from artificial intelligence for good? Which in Spanish could be translated as uh, artific inteligencia artificial, para el bien de quien? Uh, it is really a pleasure for me to introduce Sasha. I met Sasha nine years ago and I was her master thesis supervisor, so I know her pretty well. She's now a postdoctoral researcher working on artificial intelligence for humanity initiatives at Miller Institute in Canada, where she leads projects at the nexus of machine learning and social issues such as climate change, educational healthcare. She's also highly involved in her community, volunteering for initiatives such as women in machine learning, climate change, AI, and kids called Jeunesse. Okay, this talk will be organized in two parts. The first on the basics to help us all uh, understand the subject uh, more. And for instance, we will talk about um, what artificial, uh, artificial intelligence for good is. And then a second part will offer a more critical view on artificial intelligence for good. But before to start, I would like like to ask you an initial question that I got asked a while ago and that uh, I thought it was very relevant for these times. Um, so this year have been the, the ones that have been more challenging for a lot of people. Uh, what are the things that you have learned about yourself, your job, your workplace or the world or uh, your family that you could share with us today? Well, I think I learned that uh, this uh, habit of traveling is 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 great, but um, there's a lot of local things to do as well. So we definitely explored Montreal, uh, where I live, uh, and learned a lot more about the city and the parks and and the different neighborhoods. So so that so that was great. Um, I also realized that maybe uh, commuting to an office is a huge waste of time. Finally, uh, I think I would spend an hour and a half to two hours in the subway every day. And so now I have that time to, to do other things, uh, which is good. But on the flip side, I do feel like we're working more and we have less work-life distinction, delimitation uh, when we're working from home. So I think it's been it's been a mixed bag, but but overall, uh, more time spent with family and, and spent in, in, in a city that I really, really like. So overall positive, I would say. Wow. That's great to hear. And, um... Okay, so let's start with the basics uh, and set the stage. We will do some basic definitions. So to start, I will ask you what artificial intelligence for good is supposed to be? So artificial intelligence for good is a, a movement, I guess an area of research that aims to take AI applications that are used for uh, things like voice recognition, things like, uh, you know, image classification and to use them for a net positive benefit for society. So this is um, often done by working with local organizations or, or international organizations in order to understand if there are specific things that AI can help them with. So, for example, um, tracking illegal logging in the Amazon. So working with, with local organizations or the governments um, to understand, you know, what uh, what they can and cannot do given their, um, I guess, their context, right? Are there areas that they can't reach, et cetera, et cetera. And setting up an AI system that, for example, will either use satellite imagery uh, or, or sound uh, analysis in order to kind of complete um, their work. Um, and I know that social good can be a, a pretty broad topic, but uh, the idea is to define what good means with, uh, with the organizations you're working with. And in particular, uh, what kind of projects that you've been involved, you, you would say that were for AI for good? Could you talk a little bit about them? Sure. Um, there's a project that I was working on recently with, um, in Montreal, we have a kind of a, a, a nature museum called uh, the Space for life. And um, they study, I guess, from a biological perspective, from an ecological perspective, all sorts of things about um, about the environment. And so we worked with them um, for um, developing on, on developing an AI um, 
application, like a mobile app, to uh, recognize different species of uh, of butterflies. And it's it can seem as a pretty, um, I guess, uh, not very useful project, but actually. Um, Butterflies are very fragile and, and they're very important in the pollination system. So they, they'll go from flower to flower and they will pollinate um, like bees, for example. Um, but they are getting impacted as you know people chop down trees or, or parks and things like that. And so the problem is, is that um, scientists don't have the capacity to, to um, essentially keep track of what species are still um, present, which are not. And, and essentially, you know, they'll do these, uh, they call them blitzes. So once or twice a year, they'll go out and then they'll track all the different butterflies that they see. But it's a, it's a very kind of limited um, way of looking at it. And so um, they wanted to develop this app for citizen science. And so it would help people just go out in their backyard, go out in their local park and, and essentially recognize what they see around them. And so contribute to tracking biodiversity. And so, and, and since people don't know what they see, people don't recognize the, for example, the butterflies that they see, um, they wanted to use AI as a way of, of helping them identify. And so we, you know, we went back and forth on this. We, we worked with um, scientists. We learned a lot, actually. I learned a lot about insects in general. And then we developed this app that now um, is proposed by the Space for Life, so so people can either use it, you know, in the in the actual museum, or then when they go home, they can also use it in their backyard. And then it's it's a way of gathering data um, about insect biodiversity, for example. Um, yeah, I got uh, I saw that you got very excited about butterflies and your Halloween cast. Tim yes, exactly. Going to be a butterfly. <laughs> yes, it's a monarch. Uh, I, no, they probably don't go all the way down to Argentina, but here monarch butterflies are, they actually migrate from Mexico to, well, North America and Canada specifically every year. And so it's, it, and they're actually very, very impacted by, by climate change and by uh, urbanization, because typically what they do is they'll stop in different parks and different, um, well, green spaces while they migrate. And there's less of, less and less of those green spaces. So it's, it's actually really, really big uh, problem. Their numbers are plummeting quite, quite spectacularly. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I definitely fell in love with butterflies during this project. You have also worked, uh, or you're still working with the United Nations, right? Or Yes. Uh, and have you, do you want to comment about some projects or what you do there? Yeah, um, I've been working on a project for with the, the UN Global Pulse. So it's uh, the United Nations team for doing AI and data science. And um, it's a project uh, to help uh, different UN agencies gather insights and to understand better what's going on in, in different regions of the world uh, by um, analyzing radio stations. So the problem is, is that a lot of places, I mean, the problem, the, the state of the, of the fact is that many places, for example, don't have access to the internet or uh, won't necessarily have uh, people from the UN in those places like smaller rural areas or villages, but it's really important to know what's going on there. Is there for example, a big uh, a big spike in COVID cases. Are people, uh, you know, using some kind of local um, uh, I don't know herbs in order to to cure COVID? And and so the idea is to is to gather this information in order to help, for example, the WHO or uh, UN UNDP things like that to, to go in and, and to know uh, what kind of essentially help they can give. So is it by um, having people educate about the, the risks of COVID? Is it, do they actually need like more medicine? Do they need more ventilators, things like that? So they need these kinds of real-time information that they can't get uh, everywhere, right? They won't get them in, in big cities where they have um, have offices. And so uh, we set up, uh, we're setting up a platform that will monitor radio stations to identify kind of key terms, topics of conversation, and to, to create these reports. So you can be like, oh, well, in this region of Nigeria, people have been talking about, uh, you know, um, I don't know, refusing the vaccine because they don't trust it. And then that, and then, then they, they know that it's an, it's an area they should go and, and kind of try to uh, debunk some myths and things like that. And then in other cases, for example, um, you know, there's closures of schools and things like that. And it's important to, for the WHO to know that so they can make sure that people are, for example, you know, accessing basic health, uh, um, uh, like, uh, offerings. So it's, it's an idea, it's a, it's a way for them to make more informed decisions. And essentially they have so many people all over the world, they need this information in real time. So we're helping them develop this system. And, um, 
while we're doing that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out what the best way of delivering the information is because they obviously are not going to listen to every every single kind of radio show. Uh, but, uh, you know, is it reports? We've created a, a dashboard where they can, you know, enter countries, enter keywords, enter specific topics, like general topics that they want to find out about and then see across countries how people are responding to, um, I don't know, for example, I don't know, government decision making during COVID and then they can compare against uh, different countries and things like that. So it's been it's really, really interesting. And actually, the, the UN has um, is having a really hard time uh, fighting what they call the in infodemic. Uh, so so all these fake news or rumors or um, kind of things that get transmitted quickly, but it aren't and they have trouble kind of uh, addressing them in real time because uh, there's so many different rumors. Like one rumor could be that I don't know the vaccine gives you cancer. Another rumor can give you that can be that uh, I don't know the government is doing X or Y, right? And and, and it really de uh, depends from country to country. So now they have actually infodemic managers in a lot of regions that will that are working with kind of local health agencies and things like that to essentially do a, a region specific uh, information campaign because you know if people don't have access to the WHO website they're getting their information from social media they're getting their information from the radio um, it's actually hard to, to keep track of all that and I guess that there you gather information in different languages so um, do they use machine translation I guess what what's the role of artificial intelligence there in particular uh, in this kind of projects so and, we've been uh, using Oh, sorry. And very briefly, how how does that work? I mean, how how would you briefly describe how these technologies work uh, in these kind of projects? We are using uh, artificial intelligence for for transcription. So we've been training language specific models for translating radio text to I mean radio audio to to text, and that's actually quite difficult because it's not. I mean, often there's a lot of noise, often there's music, there's all sorts of, you know, commercials and things like that. So we've have to, we've been working on training specific uh, speech to text models for, for the projects in different languages. And we've been working with uh, local agencies to help us transcribe and train, transcribe the data and uh, necessary to train our model. So that's definitely been one thing. Um, another, I mean, typically, for example, at the UN, they use keyword matching a lot for um, their analyses. So they'll have these very, very long queries, uh, you know, vaccine or vaccination or blah, blah, blah. It's, it's going to be like 50 words long. And so we're trying to um, create topic modeling and, and matching that's more, um, I guess, a bit more flexible. So you don't need to define everything. So we're using <laughs> things like topic modeling, like LDA, in order to represent different uh, things that people are talking about. Um, what else are we doing? We're, we're doing um, I guess uh, the, the more high level analyses of um, what kind of words are changing over time. So, for example, we're doing word embeddings in order to see, okay, well, someone, uh, you know, the word mask, for example, before the pandemic was referring to Halloween or to carnival. Uh, now mask means something else, right? And, to, and I mean, that's kind of a, a more uh, high level example, but there are words that really change meanings. And, you know, we can do sentiment analysis to say, well, AstraZeneca for a while, uh, had this negative sentiment because of the of the clot issues, but now it's it's going um, it's going up again, and, and so we try to do different kind of metrics and different high level insights that that um, agents can can use uh, using AI. Right. So all these technologies they that you mentioned, how how they are developed, who is involved in the development of these technologies, to use things that are already available. Yeah, we well a mix. Actually, we found that a lot of the available models, well, for example, for speech speech to text transmission, don't work um, on radio text on on radio uh, audio because they were trained on audio books and it's really not the same language. So we actually had to retrain a lot of uh, the models. Um, who's working on it? Well, there's actually a whole team uh, at the UNGP at the UN Global Pulse. They have data scientists. They have. Um, infodemic managers that we've been meeting with so and they also have local teams um, who help us make sure that the tool is is useful in different contexts and and so I guess there's you know, 30 people involved in the project uh, I guess broadly speaking um, and and several data scientists but data scientists are, are definitely not the the majority 
Mm -hmm. And there's people from different countries. Uh, yeah, definitely. So the the head of the team is in is in Madrid. Uh, there's people in in the UK, in the US, uh, in Finland, in Nigeria, in I, oh yeah, in New York. The, the main office is in New York, but they've got actually offices all well in, in Kampala and somewhere else. So it's it's, it's definitely a global team. Right. Okay. So these were a bit of the basics around the topic and the definitions and understanding what's going on uh, in this area. Now um, to the second part, um, let's explore uh, who benefits from AI for good and when AI for good is not so good. Um, so some people argue that uh, the, advan uh, the advances in artificial intelligence are leading to job loss and increased surveillance. Um, and they also say that AI for good can be a slogan for AI washing. So what's AI washing? And uh, what do you think about this position or this kind of uh, argument? Uh, I guess AI washing would refer to using AI as a way of amplifying or, or, or making worse in some way um, or stronger existing tools. So uh, if someone, for example, if a, a government has a, a range of cameras in a, in a city, for example, CCTV cameras, adding AI in order to do facial identification um, would be, I guess, a way of, of uh, doing uh, AI washing. Um, I think that AI is a tool, and I um, I believe that we haven't really learned how to use that tool, I guess, ethically or morally or socially um, well yet. So I think it, it, it's a relatively new technology, and so we're because of the of the proliferation of technology currently, um, it's getting ahead of us in some cases. So we don't have this uh, reflection that we do that we should have by about using AI. So that's, for me, that's the main issue. We don't have this. So to take a step back, I guess, the people who are doing AI are mostly computer scientists, right? They're people who have, are been, have been trained to, to work with computers, to do programming, mathematics, logic, things like that. Um, as part of their education, they never learned ethics. They were never taught um, how to be more reflexive about the practice of one's work, essentially. And I think that's what's missing. So I mean, of course, there are, there are governments that are maybe again that act against the will of the people. But I mean, at the end of the day, the people who are creating these algorithms are computer scientists um, currently, <laughs> right now as things stand. And I think that that's kind of the, the 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 crux of the problem is that we, I mean, I don't have a, a traditional computer science education, so I. I, maybe I'm more reflexive, I'm a bit more um, kind of self-critiquing, but people who have done really a uh, bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in computer science often haven't been exposed to other disciplines, haven't been, you know, taught to question things, haven't been taught to, to think about the things that they're doing, and I think that's that's really the issue. That's why, I mean, that's one of the reasons why AI has been used in such a reckless way, I would say. It's because I, I, I mean, maybe I'm naive, but I, I don't think people are, are badly intentioned. I don't think it's I don't think people are, are bad or that AI is bad. I just think it's, it's, a, it's a question of, yeah, a lack of education, a lack of reflection, a lack of this general broader um, vision of AI that, that hopefully we'll, we will acquire uh, as people are becoming more uh, criti criticizing, as we're having other people do AI, right? We're having artists, we're having musicians and, and philosophers contribute to AI, that, then hopefully we'll, we'll start changing the way it's done. Okay, so you're talking for uh, about the multiplicity of disciplines to, to have this interdisciplinarity in artificial intelligence, right? Uh, oh, coming back, uh, so talking about a different kind of diversity, coming back to the question in which I asked, uh, with, uh, from where were the people involved in these United Nations projects? And you mentioned uh, the uh, United States, you mentioned Europe, you also mentioned uh, Nigeria, for instance. Would you say that in these projects, uh, the people involved in developing them uh, belong to the 
places where the technology will, will be deployed later on. And I Definitely. Hope... Yes, uh, we were working with local teams. I mean, we made different, uh, I guess, not, not really different versions, but kind of different uh, functionalities of the tool based on, like we would meet with the Africa Infodemic Management Alliance, I want to say. Anyway, so it was a, a team of people who, who are, uh, are specifically um, responsible for the African continent. We made the same thing for um, Southeast Asia. We, we would, I mean, I wasn't involved in all the meetings personally, but um, we would meet with each of the teams to figure out what they needed in the tool, what their specific asks were, what would be useful to them. And, you know, we made it a bit modular so that if, uh, for example, in Nigeria, they would need this and this and this functionality, they could use it and they didn't need to, to, to use everything we created essentially. But for sure, from the, from the beginning, we were working with, with local teams and that was the whole point. And uh, why, why do you say that that's the whole point? I mean, why do you think that's important? Well, it's because for me, if you create a tool without consulting the people who are using the tool, then you kind of miss, miss the point. Like we were even doing um, user testing, like behavioral UI testing um, with people from, with like these infodemic managers from different places. We had like 30 or 40 in the, in the end and we asked them to use the tool and to critique the tool and to break the tool and to tell us what's missing, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then at the end of the day, it was really them who said, oh, well, like, why are you, why do I have access to this? This is something I'll never use. And, oh, make sure that, you know, you, for example, add existing uh, query systems um, that we're already comfortable with that we can then, you know, build upon using these AI tools and things like that. But they, we met, I think, two or three times during the beginning of the project, we met with different people from the, the infodemic management. And then they told us that, you know, we're going the wrong way or we're missing something. And otherwise the tool would have been completely different. <laughs> Okay, um, so they were testing the system or they were also involved in the development itself of the technology? They were both. both. Okay, great. So just to, uh, to make a concrete uh, example on this, uh, I, let's imagine a hypothetical situation in a city in Argentina. Suppose that Cordoba decides to implement an artificial intelligence system to optimize energy consumption uh, who do you think has more chances of success? A local organization with medium, medium experience uh, with artificial intelligence in particular, but good knowledge of the problem and the local uh, idiosyncrasies or a big lab uh, in a developed country that excels in AI research that maybe collaborates uh, with local people uh, at some stages during the project? I definitely think that local organizations have more chances of succeeding because often, um, well, once again, not in all cases, but in, in ca the case that you, you spoke of, the technologies are exist and I mean, you can really build off of them. So you're not built, you're not starting from scratch. Right? The, the um, I guess the advantage of a big lab is that they have, for example, access to more compute, or, you know, eventually they'll have research engineers to make the whatever tool they make run faster, right? They'll have more, more of a resource advantage. Uh, but um, if you're using technologies that have existed or have been developed in, in other cases and you're applying them to your specific case, so for example, energy consumption, there are systems that have been deployed. You know, there have been lots of uh, either neural network based approaches, but also simpler ones that already exist. and it's a matter of fine tuning or, or, or um, modifying the existing uh, technology uh, to fit the, the use case. And I, so, so for that, I think that local organizations are definitely um, better placed. And um, I'm a really big fan of uh, private public partnership. So for example, working with research labs like, like, like FAMAF, like to, for example, if you have um, the government energy agency in Argentina, I don't know what's na what the name is, but working with a, a local research lab or working with a local group, group of people who are doing, for example, AI, I think that's the strongest partnership uh, in my mind because, um, you know, they have the fundamental knowledge plus the contextual knowledge and the local kind of roots and, and, and awareness because I mean, in my experience with, with, with big companies, they're often lacking the, 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 the vision of the on the ground constraints. So maybe, you know, 
transformers are not the solution to every problem. Uh, even though they're very, very powerful, they're also very research resource intensive, and they'll take a long time to train. So, you know, in, in industry, because typically there's no computational constraints, there's no um, constraints to deploying these kinds of tools, right? You'll always have a research engineer who can who can make it work for you. Um, it's easy to lose track of the of, of the realities of deploying AI and the fact that bigger doesn't mean better. And even if you have, you know, 3% more accuracy in, in using a transformer than using a simpler approach, well, maybe that's not necessarily the direction to go in. So <clears throat> in a nutshell, I think that a local partnership is much more powerful than a multinational organization. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so uh, artificial intelligence for good is frequently applied in areas related to fundamental human rights, such as health, education, poverty. Um, in your experience, can, are, can these tools cause harm instead of good in these areas? Yeah, definitely. For example, uh, something that often comes to mind is, um, I think it was last at the end of last year, um, one of the governments in, in Europe wanted to develop an AI tool to ensure that, I mean, because of COVID, the, um, to predict students' grades uh, so that they didn't have to do final exams because it was essentially complicated to, to organize these final exams. And, um, you know, they developed this AI model with a, with a local university. And finally, uh, it was very skewed. It was skewed like against um, schools in poor areas. It was skewed against uh, you know certain disciplines and not others, certain schools and not others. Anyway, there was there's a lot of problems. And finally, it got uh, it got uh, canceled. It got it, it got put away. And, and finally, the last mark was the last grade was the average, I think, of of whatever the grades were in, in, during the year. So instead of you know being smart about it, they just decided to keep it simple. And it, it created a lot of um, I mean, it was it was a big it was a big issue. There were you know students out on the street protesting, saying that it's not fair. And this is not the first time this has happened either. So I definitely think that once again, good intentions. I, I truly think that the ministry just wanted to, I guess, make it less stressful for students because doing exams in the pandemic can be very stressful. So I, I think that the really the intention was good, but um, the way it was carried out was less than ideal. So uh, definitely, yes, to your question, it, it can backfire. Um, and this is why, once again, we need uh, people involved. So I don't, I don't know who, who's working on the project specifically, but for example, uh, specialists in education, specialists in psychology, specialists in even uh, you know sociology and things like that to really make sure that the way that the, and, and to consider all other options, because you know, if you compare taking the average grade with uh, spending, I don't know, $10 million and developing the system with, uh, I don't know, postponing exams until next year, et cetera, et cetera, you have options. And a lot of these options don't involve AI. And it's not because you can use AI that you should use AI. And so, I mean, I guess we AI ethicists or people who are more critical of the usage of this technology when it's not strictly necessary in a use case, it would have been, I mean, once again, I would have appreciated having more information about the about the way the project was done, but in my mind, having this more multidisciplinary and autocritical um, approach, and and this is what I always try to um, practice and also try to transmit to people who want to do AI for good, is that you know just because you can doesn't mean you should. Get uh, the right people involved. Make sure you're having people question your work. Make sure you're getting um, the like uh, involving the people who will be using your tools. So, for example, asking some high school students, "What do you think of What do you think of this approach? Is it Is it a good idea or not?" Et cetera, et cetera. So, so having all these steps is really important to make sure that projects don't backfire. Essentially, regarding um, who finances these projects, so you were talking about some projects of, uh, from the United Nations. Uh, how about when? AI for good projects are done inside uh, big tech companies. Um, do you think there are differences uh, in these two kinds of projects? Do you know about projects that have been developed uh, inside companies? Uh, I yeah, I mean there are definitely teams within companies that do data science for good or, or AI for good. Um, I guess the, I think it depends on the company, but often the um, motivation can differ. So 
it can be really solving a problem that exists and can't be solved in other ways than using AI. That's definitely one possibility. But sometimes it's, uh, I don't know, tax tax breaks <laughs> or, or some more um, more material reasons. So it, it's really hard to say. Uh, I think that in terms of who's funding AI for Good Research um, at a UN level, they definitely have funding and they definitely do projects. So that's one source. Um, there's really great initiatives, for example, at Stanford, they have a data science for good team. Um, I want to say, um, well, for example, at, at Mila, the, the lab where I've been at for the last two years, we also have a, an AI for, for humanity team. So there's also that, um, that type of research. In big companies, um, I've seen some interesting research. For example, Microsoft has an AI for good team that, that, that are very, um, are very thorough. They 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 uh, published an article recently that was really interesting. It was like be becoming good at AI for good or something. I think that was the title. And um, they talked about a lot of the things that we're talking about now, like connecting with stakeholders and making sure that uh, AI is properly evaluated and things like that. So it's hard to say. You know, across big tech, things are like this. I think it, it really depends on on the way that uh, the the projects are done. Um. And if you had to say, what are the critical questions to consider before investing into such projects? You've already mentioned like contacting the appropriate stakeholders, the people that will actually use the system needs to be involved uh, in all steps of the development. Uh, do you have some other uh, things that you would like to point to that you think are critical uh, when developing these kind of technologies? Uh, yeah, I think that one thing that I've uh, realized is that data is often the uh, bottleneck. So people assume that there's data. I mean, I guess we're <laughs> we're a bit um, spoiled in that sense, is that we assume that there's data for everything. And uh, for example, here in Montreal, we wanted to do a hackathon of AI for good. And we reached out to all these different, um, for example, homeless shelters and food kitchens, and we really wanted to help them you know, optimize uh, the way that they were doing things. And then we realized even lines at, uh, for example, the, the homeless shelter, and there's no way of tracking donations at the food bank. And they actually said, well, <laughs> we're not at AI yet, but we would like some uh, court or like a, a, a workshop of how to use, um, how to use uh, Microsoft Office or how to use uh, spreadsheets. And so essentially what we did, well, this was like two years ago now, we, we organized a series of workshops and we went into these food, kitch food kitchens and, and homeless shelters in order to teach them how to, how to gather data, how to keep track of, you know, how much food is coming in, how much food they're giving, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially that was the, that was the conclusion. So it was like, come back in a couple of years when we have this up and running. And also, you know, talking about things like privacy, talking about things like uh, what is it that you want to keep track of? What is important to you uh, in order, you know, for example, is it important for you to know that someone's coming back several times? Is it important to know that they have stopped coming back for some reason? Because sometimes that's also important, right? And so we did these interesting workshops where it was like per organization, there was, I think, two or three people from, I guess, data science and then the, the, the staff from the local organization. And then it was very eye-opening to me because we started with this like, oh, let's do AI together. And then finally it was like, what was really useful for them is to, to learn how to, how to use a spreadsheet. Um, so I think that once again, we come from a place of privilege thinking that AI can, can do a lot and, and maybe it can, but taking a step back, a, t a step or five steps back and, and, and looking at the bigger picture and looking at what's the reality of the organization you want to work with or the problem you want to solve uh, that's often overlooked and then people, you know, end up solving problems that are not the real problem or using data that's not not uh, relevant or, or, or can't be applied, right? So there's there's a bunch of kind of mistakes that you can make, but um, being un understanding, really understanding um, the context of application is, is, is for me, is the, the number one thing. Yeah. Um... Yeah, artificial intelligence system can make big mistakes uh, that a human a human wouldn't do, right? So that's a big part of having good uh, artificial intelligence systems, understanding the kind of mistakes that they will or may make. Um, okay, so just to to close this uh, this 
talk with you. So why are you part of this? How, what motivates you to, to be working on these topics? Uh, well, I realized that um, also a couple of years ago, so I was working uh, as an applied AI researcher in finance and I realized that um, the work I was doing was not aligned with my values as a person. Um, not that it was orthogonal, it wasn't completely against it, it was just not what I value most. So I think my values are really kind of social implication and, um, for example, uh, fighting climate change and, and things like that. And, and I realized that I can't do work that is not, I mean, it's hard for me, I guess, to do work that's not aligned, that's not parallel to, to what I actually believe in. And, so at the time I wanted to quit my job and start, uh, for example, volunteering at soup kitchens or, or you know, doing climate activism. Um, and then I, I discovered this field that is still very new, that's still very um, in development. And then I, I kind of decided that it was the best way for me to, to leverage this kind of social, this, this desire for social justice and, and sustainability alongside the, the techniques um, that I've like the technical things that I've mastered. And so for me, it's, it's the only work I, I can imagine myself doing, honestly, uh, I guess teaching and, and, and research is, is really important. And currently it's true that the, um, the discourse of AI, really the, the public perception of AI has been mm, dominated by big tech, has been dominated by consumer applications, right? So like Siri and, and Google maps, but I don't think it, it's, obliged to be that way. And I, and I see organizations like the UN and I see, you know, local data science initiatives that are trying to change the, the perception of AI to make it a public good, to make it really like something that's not just for the big tech elites to use in global North countries. And, and that's what I want to contribute towards. I want to contribute towards democratizing AI and, and educating and awareness raising. And it's a really powerful tool, but I find that currently it's, it's, it's very, I mean, it's used in a way that's kind of um, very narrow and it is not necessarily um, obliged to be that way. And part of the problem is that, yeah, big tech pays more and it's more it's more fun because you have access to unlimited compute and all this, you know, all these fun toys. But there's also alternatives. There's alternative ways of using AI. And that's what I, I hope to contribute to. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, for sharing this time with us. Um, so thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Lou. <laughs> it was great. <laughs>